great to be here. Great to get to be the first uh, presentation of the year. Um, super great time to be uh, getting to work and do GIS work in Idaho. I mean, I think Keith would agree. Uh, we're pretty lucky folks that get to work in this state. I'm looking out the window right now at Lake Pend and snow on the mountains. It's just a beautiful time of year. Um, so uh, Keith, the last presentation or so, or I think maybe it's in November, talked a little bit about mosaic data sets. And um, I had mentioned to Keith that um, at Innovate, we're you know, using mosaic data sets quite a bit. And there was some kind of advanced um, topics on that that might be worthy of sharing with folks. And so that's what I would do today, is just kind of show you guys a little bit about what we're doing at Innovate. Um, some of you maybe know me for quite a while, like Keith. Um, I was the GIS manager at the Coeur d'Alene Tribe for about 20 years. And then for the past eight years, I've had the privilege of working for this company, Innovate Inc. And I manage the IT and the geospatial division of Innovate Inc. Um, and a, a good share of us work out of our, uh, work out of our homes and our slippers, like <laughs> I truthfully am wearing right now. So um, anyway, if you ever have an interest in that, feel free to reach out to me. But we've got a really great group of team at Innovate. We work for about 25 different clients right now, and the data I'm going to be showing you today comes from one of the projects I worked on with US EPA. And I don't think it's an uncommon problem. Um, I'm going to slide one of the web app viewers over here into the screen for you all. And so, um, and this same project, actually another, you know, a variation on the theme came up just recently with a client. So EPA Region 9 covers, um, California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and um, the Pacific Islands. And so kind of anything that happens within that purview falls within our wheelhouse of work we support EPA at Region 9. And so a recent project that just came up yesterday is there's some contamination they're looking at in Los Angeles. And they're, they're curious about this contamination and where it's come from, and they're, they're, they know there's a site there that could be contributing this, so they want to look at historic photos over time. Um, and there's many sites to get historic photographs, so here's a site at UCSB. And so if I zoom down into Los Angeles, um, we'll notice there'll be a bunch of points that show up on the screen eventually here. And those points are photo locations um, of all kinds of historic photographs that have been taken over time. And, you know, the University of Idaho has collections of them. I'm sure Keith has collections of photos and points at ISU. And then, um, but simply having a photo is great, but what's really powerful is making a background for your GIS so you can see what happened there. Um, and so what, in this particular case, each of these photos represents a photo center, We'll be downloading a bunch of photos and then making basically an orthophoto dis display in the background of the GIS. And that's all well and good. Um, but it's you want your photos to look nice together. You want them to go from one photo to the next photo, and there's a nice transition in the photo. There's not a hard line. The roads don't start in one place and end at another place between photos. So this mosaic data topic that I'm going to talk about is how to kind of achieve that using some of these advanced um, functionalities. Um, and so the first thing you need is a bunch of photographs. And so you can either download them off a site like I have here, and you can click on a point and um, you know, download a photograph here if you wanted to. Um, or um, if you have some other source of photographs, so in my particular case, so in, in this particular case, US EPA has an aircraft and a sensor called the aspect sensor. And aspect is really designed to pick up contamination and sense radiation. And so, and it's very much like a LIDAR sensor where it's, it's kind of shooting out a stream of um, readings across the ground and collecting them as dots. But in addition to that data collection, they also have a camera on board. And that camera is taking frames just like you would in a normal aerial imagery acquisition. Um, and so the task at hand there was great, you know, get all these photographs, they've already been registered and rectified, and mosaic them together. And so we had about 1,482 images. Um, we looked at different formats. I mean, if you look at JPEG 2000, they're nine megabytes a piece. 
if you look at a bill format, which is similar to TIFF, is maybe 79 megabytes a piece. And so putting that all together, as you can see here, depending upon file format, um, is, a, is, a, is a decent chunk of data. Um, we elected to do the JPEG 2000 format just because of um, disk space. And there's a lot of different pros and cons of doing different image formats. But regardless of which one you go with, um, the Mosaic image data set can simply handle that. Um, one, one thing to note is when you're processing all these images, it can take quite a bit of time. Um, we have an Amazon instance where we're going to be serving this as an image service and consuming it within web apps that are written um, using the Esri JavaScript API. And so initially we started processing all the images because it's a whole bunch of data. You get it up there. You don't want to move it around a lot. Um, and so we started processing it on the AD AWS server. So we had ArcGIS Pro up there and, you know, we created a mosaic data set and then started creating this footprint process and it ran for days and days and days. Um, you know, and it wasn't a inadequate machine. It was probably 16 or 32 gigs of RAM, multiple processors, but it, it just took forever. Um, and so I went ahead and downloaded a subset of that data and ran it locally on, you know, a decent arc, you know, a decent GIS workstation that I had locally here. And I found out that I could actually run the whole data set that was taking days and days and days in literally a half an hour. So anyway, just a note note for folks out there. So no, not all processing. The Amazon isn't the panacea for everything, I guess. Um, and that was our experience here. But on with the rest of the story. So um, of course, the data never comes in the format that you really want it to. So since we're creating a web map and we're consuming it within a web service and a web map, um, I like to try to project everything into the same projection. So I wrote a a little script in Python to go out and reproject everything into Web um, Auxiliary Spear, Web Mercator Auxiliary Spear. So get it all in the same projection. And I absolutely know that Esri says, oh yeah, you know, we can project on the fly. But if you're going to project on the fly thousands and thousands of images, you're going to take a hit for that. And um, you know, if you're just doing you know 10 or 100, it's probably not a big deal. But if you're doing thousands, then it becomes an issue. So you really do want to try to get stuff into the same projection. That's kind of best practices. So project everything. That takes a quite a bit of time, multiple days probably to do thousands of photographs. Um, and then, you know, create the mosaic data set. And Keith walked us through this last time. So, um, you know, to create a new kind of thing, right click in our, our catalog, create it, tell it what the name of the geo, um, the mosaic data set is, set the projection, create it. Pretty simple. Once you have the mosaic data set, the next step then is to add the images into the mosaic data set. And that's simply navigating it, saying, hey, this is where I'm keeping those data. Now that I've projected them, here they are, they're in this folder. Um, you know, maybe you want to do something like I did here where you, uh, you know, calculate the statistics and things like that on it. And then, whoop, suck them into the mosaic data set. And Keith demonstrated that well in the last, last call we had. Um, and so if you go in and look in um, Arc Catalog or ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap at this data, this is kind of what it looks like when it comes in. And so you'll notice that, you know, it's, <clears throat> there's some funkiness here. So I'll drag my mouse over here. So the, the footprints are these red boxes here. So each red box represents the area around a photograph. And um, you know, as we might expect, each photograph has some black area because they've been rotated, they've been projected. And so one of the first things we wanna do is, is to say, hey, we, this in like human terms, this really isn't the footprint. The footprint is actually this area where the photograph is, and that's important. Because um, we're only actually interested in that area of where the photo is. We're not ex interested in this blank area outside the box, so to say. So to do that, you need to reprocess. There's a command to do that. And so we can rebuild the footprints. And to do that, I use the radiometric option down here, it's the computational method. And when you do that, it then, it then identifies, hey, this is actually the area of the photograph. So that's the true image boundary. 
And in the example that Keith showed um, last time we went through mosaic data sets, he used a, um, a data set that it, there really wasn't overlap or issues like that. I forget what you used, Keith, maybe it was an ortho photo or a, or a you know, digital raster graphic or whatever. And so for some data sets, this isn't really an issue. But for where you have a flight of photographs, be it collected off of, off of an airplane or a satellite or even a drone, you have overlap. And the, the, the task at hand is, well, what's the best way to combine that together? Um, for those of us that took um, you know, remote sensing in college, and I'm sure there's remote sensing classes there at ISU or other places still, um, one of the, the things we learned in remote sensing is the further you're at, out from the center of the photograph, the more distortion is that occurs. So what you really want to do is you want to figure out a way to only take the middle of the photograph at all possible. But if there's no photograph on this side over here, there's no overlap, well, you might want to grab that area out there because you don't want it to be blank. So maybe some distortion is acceptable. And so, um, and so many, many moons ago, back when Keith and I were young and good looking, um, I wrote a bunch of code in ArcGIS AML to clip the centers out of photographs. And I think I created a mosaic data set before there was a mosaic data set for all the 1933 images. So I went out to the University of Idaho, we scanned all the images and we made a nice photo mosaic of that. And we had to clip all that out. And it took, you know, days and days and weeks and weeks to do all that and lots of review. And the beautiful thing with the mosaic data set now is that's just inherently part of the product and it's a few clicks away. So I derivate. So anyway, we've created some footprints. The next step then, is to create these things called seam lines. And so seam lines is how you're actually going to put the photograph together. So it's kind of the cookie cutter or think of a jigsaw puzzle of how you want to put the photographs together. And ArcGIS is automatically using this thing down on the right. When you say build seam lines, you can say for the computational method, use edge detection. And so it's going to figure out the best way to slide this photograph here and this photograph here together um, and to make it appear that they're not two separate photographs or one photograph. Now, one of the things you'll note here is that, um, so keep in mind with aspect imagery, the reason they're collecting the data is to collect radiational, radiation data off the ground. They're not really concerned about cloud cover and things like that. And so these photos are kind of a secondary part of the process. And that's what you're seeing here is you're seeing some clouds and things like that in the photograph. Because, you know, they want to get photos, but it's really a secondary product. So in a, in a perfect flight, like a NAIC flight or something like that, they would choose a day when there wasn't clouds in the air. But for aspect, they don't really give that much of a hoot about it. But the end being is that we want to put both of these images together. So the next thing, I want to show you kind of a before and after. So here we are where two photos come together. Um, and before, we'll notice that the photo down below, the roads don't quite line up. And I think it's important, especially as GIS practitioners, um, people pick up on stuff like that. And they'll note that, um, you know, man, this GIS data is not very good stuff, you know. How come, how come the roads don't line up? How come, you know, these mountains or hills, they don't, it doesn't make sense. And so if we can make sure our data products look really quality, then we can have a product like this. And we can see that there's still a slight derivation down here. This is where the photos using that um, seam line process occurred, but it's, it's much more gradual and, and you can't really see a seam or anything in the outlying areas. So I think it did a really kind of phenomenal job of that. Um, so we're going to kind of continue using the mosaic data set. There's some other tools out there from Esri. Um, for example, drone to map is probably another tool that be, could potentially be utilized um, to produce a mosaic um, outside of quote unquote the mosaic data set format. So that's probably something else that we've been playing with with a few other clients. But um, overall, we've been really happy with the results of this. Um, so that's, that's a quick summary of more of the advanced topics and how we used it to innovate. Certainly, if anybody has questions, feel free to shout them out now or shoot me an email, and we'll go from there. Keith, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. And as I said, we're going to be, um, we have recorded this, 
and we will uh, process it and get it pushed out to our YouTube channel in, in short order, probably see it uh, next week. So it's great stuff. Um, you know, you, you've done a lot of, of work on this to, um, to discover, you know, these different tricks, if you want to call it that. And, and thank you very much for sharing uh, those things with us because it's going to make everyone else's life a little bit easier instead of doing a lot of experimentation and say, hey, I saw this presentation that Frank did and he did this and it worked like that. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So, uh, so thanks again, Frank. And uh, we'll open the floor for any questions that folks might have. You can either unmute yourself and ask, or if you don't have a microphone, put your question into the, um, into the chat.